So welcome back. We're opening our notes to the number seven that says deposition by river slash stream. And we will use those terms interchangeably river stream. Um, and we're going to be giving you prompts about your notes just to kind of keep it a little bit better organized, but definitely be aware oftentimes throughout this presentation, we're going to reference page six and we'll tell you more about that in a minute, but we're talking about deposition with running water and water sorts things. Here to tell you all about it. All right, here I am. So again, we've used page six before and we know that faster water can carry larger particles, slower water can't. So when we did erosion, we kind of did a little bit of deposition. If you think of deposition, it has the word deposit in it. And if you were to go to the bank and deposit money, you drop it off. So we're focusing now on how water drops off sediments. Okay, and because faster water can carry larger sediments, larger sediments, as water slows down, it will drop off the larger ones first, and then the smaller ones later. So as we're talking about this, if you could kind of think, if you've ever been down a water slide, and hopefully you have, because they're fun, uh, when you hit that large body of water, the pool, um, your velocity slows down, and that's what happens with water. When you're in a river or stream, and you're flowing over the earth, say down a large hill, you're going really fast. If you go into a large body of water, that river or stream is going to slow down and that's where deposition will start. So here you have this blurry diagram. Now we're going to get sorting in all different places of a river and stream. We're just going to organize it a little bit for you. But in the meanwhile, you're looking at this really blurry, horrible picture. It's in your notes, but we have a mountainous region that a stream is heading down to a flatter plain region. Okay, so the velocity of the water would be higher because we have a steeper gradient in the mountainous region, and then it would slow down as we get to the flatter region. So here's a non-blurry version of your picture. Through some digital wizardry. Yes, horizontal sorting. So if you notice here in the picture, it shows that we have some horizontal sorting as the river goes from this mountainous region down to the flatter region. So because the velocity of the water slows down, we'll get gravel that's dropped off first and gravel meaning like pebbles. Okay, so pebbles would be dropped off some pebbles, not all of them. Then we, as it slows down even further because the gradient is flatter, we'll get some sand dropped off. And then as you go and you get further and closer to the large body of water, we're gonna get like silt and clay. This is our smaller particles. So you'll get some horizontal sorting happening in the stream. And then you're gonna get even more horizontal sorting as that stream enters the large body of water. Well said. So that's page six, Trans relationship of transported particle size to water velocity. And it's giving you the different stream velocities and what type of particles it can carry. Um, and then obviously as the river velocity decreases, the particle size that it can carry gets smaller and smaller. So this is essentially reminding you that water will sort sediments. This is what it's showing you. So we're always concerned about our notes. This is the diagram you're going to be drawing to represent horizontal sorting, very simplified. Yeah. So right. Right under where number two, it says draw a diagram of horizontal sorting below. This is gonna be it. Now I know this is really tough for you to draw, but you're gonna start with the big circle because they get dropped off first and then the circles are gonna get smaller. So the mouth of the river is where the river meets a large body of water. So if I were swimming and had a, a mask on and I was looking down at the particles that were being deposited, my particles would be largest where the river enters the large body of water or the mouth, and as I was swimming further and further away, or farther and farther away, my particle size would get smaller and smaller. All right, so that's horizontal sorting. You're gonna get it in both the stream, and then again, when you enter that large body of water. So here's a picture representation of what you might notice or see. Um, and again, since it's running water, they are sorted by size. The larger particles are dropped off first, and then the particles get smaller and smaller and smaller as you move away from the mouth of the river. It's telling you decreasing in size. 
So this is actually, this is just repeating everything. Okay. So heavier, larger sediments will be dropped off first and smaller will be dropped off further out. Okay. And that's like at the mouth of a river, you might get like pebbles that get dropped off first. And then as you get further out, if you were to swim from the mouth of the river out into the center of the large body of water, the sediment size would just be smaller. That's below you. It goes back to this wonderful graph that you probably can't get enough of. So if you want to stop right here and take a selfish with it, or I mean, I'm sorry, a selfie, and then you could post it because it'd be really cool. It's awesome. It's pretty fabulous. It's awesome. Is that enough time for them to do it, do you think? They're pretty proficient with selfish, I mean, selfies, selfies right? Selfies, yeah. yeah. Cool. So this is a, through digital wizardry, oh this God. is something we came up with. We animated in the different particles and how they would deposit. And you notice that the larger particles get deposited first. Did you animate each one of these? Yes, and I named all of them. That's George right there. Tom, Bill, Hank, Bob, Henrietta, Hildegard. Helga. Yeah, and then watch and this. Minions. Boulders, cobbles, pebbles, sand, silt, everybody's favorite clay, colloids, and ions in solution. Pretty good band name, ions in solution. Where are you going tonight? I'm going to go see ions in solution. Oh, yeah. I love that live version. It's awesome. Ions in solution. So you got it. Yeah. Oh, yeah cool. Okay. Oh. See, you bring up something really good here. You're also talking about density. Denser particles, obviously, are going to settle faster. Okay, but now in questions, you're not going to be asked. It, it really comes down to a little bit of common sense. Larger particles, denser particles will settle before less dense, smaller. And you also have shape too, which we're going to talk about all these factors a little bit later on. So just, you know, stay put. It's okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the best is yet to come. Now, as the river enters this large body of water, you're going to get additional sorting that's going to occur. So we call this vertical sorting. Unlike horizontal, like the horizon, vertical is up-down sorting. What gets dropped off first? What gets deposited first, though, in vertical sorting? Hmm, same rule applies. What? The larger, heavier particles are going to get deposited first in the large body of water, and then the smaller, less dense on top. So let's say we're looking in your notes. The larger right here, you're filling it in under vertical sorting. The larger, heavier particles will settle first. So we're using the terms coarse and fine. So the coarse particles will settle first and then the fine particles will settle last. So looking at your notes, you're going to draw this diagram and you don't have to replicate it perfectly. However, please don't forget about this particle right over here. He got left out last year and he just hasn't recovered since. So just everything else doesn't much matter, but please, please don't forget Balthazar. Balthazar was so upset when that happened. So it just would mean a lot to Balthazar if you could just make Sad, sure you draw. Balthazar sounds like he's just an evil, like... No, he's sensitive. Let's not, let's not judge. It's sensitive. No, okay, judge. Balthazar. He just sounds like an evil character, like the villain. Hmm. All right. This is giving you an idea of something called graded bedding, which sounds more complicated than what it is. But imagine if there was an area that experienced a flood. Well, what's going to get deposited first? So... First, let's say the first season that they get this large flood, okay, water comes down the river and then the river enters that large body of water and you get this, de this deposition, this vertical sorting, okay? And this would be our first flooding event. So the larger particles settled and then the smaller ones. Then the following year, they have another flood. The river again carries sediment down the mountains into the large body of water you're going to get another depositional event where you have large particles and then finer particles. Notice that this is still following that same rule that we keep repeating. Larger particles get settled first, smaller settle last. So if you were in this area and you were digging and you would see the fine particles and as you go, go down the hole, you notice it's getting coarser and coarser and coarser, which makes sense for a single depositional event. You would say, wow, these particles were sorted by running water, but 
then you keep on digging, he comes turns to fine again, and that almost seems illogical, but then you could say, okay, well, this was two separate flooding events that occurred in that area. And it can be recorded in rock as well. Over time, these sediments can actually um, cement and become a sedimentary rock. So these sediments form sedimentary rocks, which we haven't done yet, but we will. And that's what that rock would look like. So obviously these sediments were deposited first, and then over time, the sediments squishing down on top of the other sediments pushes the water out, it dries out and becomes sedimentary rock. You can see that this is an example of graded bedding being recorded in rocks itself. So again, graded bedding, we have two events here. And then if we look at something in real life here, we can see a couple of events happen. We have, it looks like there's almost lines here, right? So these lines, we can see our coarse material and then fine, and then a line of coarse material and then fine, and then coarse material and then fine. So this, we have about four events here about because we have coarse and then fine. So we have one event. Here it is, coarse, then fine, two events, coarse, then fine, three, coarse, then fine, four. Nice job. Thank you. I can count. And then this is something we'll see when we do geologic history, where you'll, you'll have a picture of, uh, you know, rock formations, and then they'll have a little diagram to the right. This is showing you that we had three separate depositional events. And again, it was recorded in rock, which is kind of cool. So it's not just the sediments, but the rock itself is showing that. Pretty neat. And this is a real life picture. And you can see I have over here, I have coarse particles. Below it is fine. So that must have been a separate depositional event. Here is another separate dep depositional event. Here is another separate depositional event. So there's a series of depositional events that occurred here that you could say with great certainty that these were separate depositional events. So this area at one point in time experienced a massive flood and then nothing. And then and a well, it used flood to be underwater. Yeah. It used to be underwater and has since come out of the water, which we'll discuss later. So pause it right here, read the question. And we're going through some digital wizardry. We're going to show you the answer. So this here, we have a river that's entering a large body of water called the ocean. Yep. And on the right hand side, what do we have? We have a data table showing zone A, B, C, and D, and then major sediment sizes. So what do you notice about the sizes as I go from zone A, B, C, and D? What do you notice about the sizes? I think they're getting smaller. Zone A has the largest particles. Zone D has the smallest particles. So how is this pattern of horizontal sorting produced? Which answer makes the most sense? High density materials generally, generally settle more slowly. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Rounded sediments generally settle more slowly. I don't know about that one. Mm, that's definitely not true. Dissolved minerals are generally deposited first. No, they're not. Mm. Bigger particles are generally deposited first. Same rule we've been discussing, whether it's vertical sorting or horizontal sorting, the larger particles generally get deposited first. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about what would affect, what factors would affect the rate at which a particle would be deposited. And we're gonna start with the sediment size. I don't know if we've repeated this enough, but Larger sediments settle faster than smaller sediments. So in your notes, this is 8A, so you should fill that in. And then try to do the graph. What kind of relationship would this be? This is 8B between particle size and settling rate. Ooh, wait. Remember, rate is how fast it settles. That's what I was just going to ask, what the rate means. That's how fast. So that would be the size, particle size getting bigger as we move away from the origin and the relationship would be a direct relationship because remember it's settling rate, not settling time. So as the particle size increases, the rate at which it will settle will also increase. It will, it will settle at a faster rate of speed. Some might even say it's a direct relationship. Mm. Mm. Sediment shape, you can see this 8C. Friction between water on the surface of the particle slows down settling, fluid friction. Therefore, as surface area increases, the time it takes to settle also increases. Now let's talk about surface area. This is kind of referring to almost like how flat an object is. So think about it. If you jump in to a pool and you do pencil, 
that's a smaller surface area. You're going to go right to the bottom. But if you decide to jump in and you flatten yourself, so you do a belly flop, you're not going to sink to the bottom. Probably get hurt too. Yeah. And everybody always goes, oh, after somebody does a belly flop. Yeah, because it hurts. Yeah. So that's giving you an idea. So Obviously, the flatter particle will take a longer time to settle. So what does that look like? Well, there's our rounder particle, and then there's our particle gets flatter. And what kind of relationship would that be? Because remember, we're looking at settling rate again. How fast it's settling, the rate of speed at which it would settle. So the flatter particle would settle much at a much slower rate of speed, and the rounder particle would settle at a much faster rate of speed. Cool, an indirect relationship. Particle density, right? You know, it's 8D, which is more dense, a bowling ball or a soccer ball? What do you think, which one's more dense? Um, can I have like a multiple choice for this one? A bowling ball or a soccer ball, and I'll give you a hint. It has alliteration, uh -huh. and it, it, it the, the, it's two words, and both words begin with the letter B. Which would be alliteration, right? Yeah. Okay. Bowling ball. Nice job. Well played. Thank you. Denser particles settle faster than less, less dense particles. So there's that bowling ball, and then there's the soccer ball. Okay. It's tough stuff. So as density increases, what happens to the rate of speed that the particle will settle? So that's supposed to be a denser particle that's less dense, and that would be a direct relationship. So try this question. Pause it. Which graph best shows the relative settling times for each of the four particles? Now, notice they're switching to time here and not rate. Ooh. So we're looking at settling time, not the rate, like he said. Settling time meaning how much time it would take to settle, not the rate of speed. And they're using bar graphs here. And you got to read the boring stuff above. I hate the boring stuff. Digital wizardry, answer says... Choice B. So it would take less time for a larger particle to settle, and it would take more time for the smaller particle to settle. And choice C would be the correct answer if on the y-axis we had settling rate instead of settling time. Yeah. Okay, so number nine in your notes. You're going to get some things down right now for summary of water erosion. Running water is the most powerful agent on Earth. Sometimes here it is the primary agent of erosion. It smooths and rounds out rocks and deposits them according to size. Which is very nice. And the faster the water moves, the more erosion we're gonna have. The slower water will wind up dropping off material. Also known as deposition. So that was just a quick little summary of running water. We're going to talk about something else, right? Oh, the most important thing. Rivers carve out V-shaped valleys. If you remember from the last uh, wee video that we did, we showed you some V-shaped valleys that the down cutting of a stream will do to a landscape region. So just keep that in mind. Put a star next to that. That's really important. You see a V-shaped valley. It was eroded by a stream. It's also nice that the word river has the letter V in it. Just a <clears throat> coincidence? Think I think not. not. So we're going to talk now about glaciers, or some people say glaciers. Okay, glaciers. So glaciers are really large pieces of ice. And we're not talking about, it's not even a piece of ice. It could cover an entire continent. If you look at this glacier here, okay, this is ice that has built up. And these are actually mountains. That's how deep or how thick this ice sheet is that's covering this continent. Okay, so you're looking at ice that's almost as tall as mountains. Okay, and you can actually see here, it moves down, it almost looks like a river of ice. And that's because as the snow builds up, okay, it will press down on the snow below it and it will begin to turn to ice over thousands, millions of years. If you notice, it moves down gradient because pulled by gravity, ice will move downward towards the ocean, okay? Here, you can see this ice sheet is almost as tall as these mountains up here, and it moves down gradient because gravity pulls it down gradient. 
So this is an example of a valley glacier, them coming down from the mountains. And as Mrs. Bosham said earlier, the continental glaciers cover continents and think about piling sand. If I start piling sand, that sand eventually reach a point where it collapses and moves out in all directions. So when your rate of snow accumulation is greater than your rate of melting, that glacier will advance. When your rate of melting is greater than the snow accumulation, that glacier will retreat. And now a lot of times you'll hear glaciers being compared to bulldozers. They bulldoze, they just level stuff. They just run right through it, knock stuff over, grab stuff. You'll sometimes hear plucking, it'll pluck stuff and just carry it. So you could kind of see the dirt in the glacier itself. That's from picking up all those sediments. And you can see on the sides over here, they're called lateral, lateral moraines. They're picking up material and just ripping it off the side of the mountain. And this is just to show you where the glacier meets the water. Now, finally, when the glacier meets the water, this is where we're gonna get calving or the breaking off of ice. And this is where icebergs come from. Icebergs come from ice that has calved or broken off of the glacier when it meets the ocean. Okay, and are those, is that not just dirt? Or is yeah, people? Okay. Dirt, yeah, okay, it's yeah. dirt. Here though, you can see just how high the ice is. This is comparing to give you scale. We're not talking about little pieces of ice here. We're talking about very large continental glaciers. And Long Island at one point in time was covered by a glacier or a glacier. And it was over a mile thick, 5,280 feet thick. And this is showing you two people doing what's called glacier traveling. And you could see that there are cracks in the glacier, right? They're sometimes called crevices or some people say crevasses and I'm not even being funny. They actually do say crevasses. A lot of people say crevasses. I guess it's about 50, 50 split. Well, a crevice is actually a small space. It's spelled differently than crevasse. A crevasse is a large space. Okay, that's why it's not a crevice. It's not a small space. Okay, because if you fell down here, you would fall down hundreds of feet. And you'd get wedged in the ice too. That's the other thing, because it does it does constrict in a certain area. And that's somebody ice climbing up the glacier um, in order to do some glacier travel. It's kind of crazy stuff. Yeah, I'm not really a big ice glacier person. Again, this is just showing you, remember, this is a close up. So this, this sheet of ice is almost as tall as the mountains because underneath this ice is the rest of the mountain. And as it melts, you can see you wind up with rivers that flow down into the crevasse, okay, and beneath the glacier. So now you're gonna watch the video and we'll come back to the presentation in a moment. Here's something we all take for granted. Liquid things flow like liquids and solid things flow like, well, solid things don't flow, right? Not so fast. Glaciers are cool, and not just because they're made of ice. I'm here at Mendenhall Glacier, which is one of about 40 glaciers in the Juneau Ice Field. Glaciers are cool because the way that they move, even the very fact that they move, seems to defy physics. It's a solid that flows like a liquid. How? That is a question of glacial proportions. To figure out how a glacier moves, first let's go back to the beginning. Uh, not that beginning. The beginning of the glacier. And first, we've got to get up there. I'm super excited. I've never been in a helicopter before, and we're going to take this thing up to the top of a glacier. This ice is born in the ocean. Warm, moist air from the Pacific rises up coastal mountains where it cools, condenses, and falls as snow and rain. 30 meters of snow, sometimes more, falls in this ice field every year. You need more than a mountain of snow to make a glacier. You also need the right climate. Even in summer, it's summer here right now, even though it doesn't look like it, it dips below freezing here. What that means is the accumulation of snow in winter it exceeds the snow melt in summer. And this lets the snow pile up layer after layer every year. A cubic meter of snow weighs anywhere from 70 to 150 kilograms, about the same as one or two adult humans. But most of that volume is air. As it piles up, the collective force on all of that fluffy stuff begins a transformation. Working hard here. 
First, all those pretty little snowflake shapes are totally shattered into smaller grains. As they're packed together, the air pockets between them shrink. The snow becomes denser. After about two years, ground snow transitions into a new form called fern. Fern is an intermediate form between snow and glacier ice. It's about two thirds the density of water, and it can take many more years for that to transition into its final form. That final form is a big mass of dense bubble-free ice. The ice in Mendenhall is flowing forward more than a half meter every day. Glaciers are often compared to rivers of ice, and that's not wrong. These giant solid structures behave with liquid-like tendencies. I know what you're thinking. Ice moves because it melts, but glaciers can move without melting. Mendenhall is pretty solid. I mean, I could jump up and down on it. It doesn't deform it, but these short-term stresses don't do anything. Long-term stress, like bearing its own enormous weight, can bend and deform this ice. What we're told makes something a solid rather than a liquid is that its atoms and molecules are so tightly bonded they can't move past each other. But this isn't the case with glacial ice. Its water molecules are arranged in an orderly pattern, but under certain conditions, they can still flow. Much of this has to do with the pressure melting point. As pressure increases, the melting point of ice decreases. When glacier ice stays close to but just below that point, it becomes malleable, much like how you can bend and deform solid metal when it's heated near its melting point. Watch out for that. The deepest layers of a glacier are subjected to the most pressure. That's the zone of plastic flow, because the bonds between the ice crystals can be stretched rather than broken. Here, the molecular bonds between ice crystals actually stretch and slide past each other rather than break, like how a deck of cards deforms as cards slide past each other. Magic. When the bottom of the glacier needs to move around large obstacles like boulders, even higher pressures on the uphill side cause the ice to melt, flow around the obstacle, and refreeze on the other side. As these processes continue, the glacier creeps along, propelled by gravity, like some giant gooey conveyor belt. But up here in the top of the glacier, in this upper 150 feet or so, that's the zone of brittle flow. And the ice isn't under as much pressure, so when it's stressed, it's prone to cracking, which is why we see these beautiful crevasses and things like this. Imagine a candy bar warping around a curved surface. The top has to curve farther and faster, so it cracks while the gooey bottom bends and stretches. Some glacier movement comes from slipping on sediment or a thin layer of water, but most glaciers not at Earth's poles move by this process of deforming. But glaciers are a product of climate, and they change with the climate. Mendenhall Glacier is currently slinking along a 13-mile journey to its lowest point, Mendenhall Lake. The terminal edge of a glacier is one of the easiest places to see its movement in action, but it's also where we can see how much things are changing. Glaciers never move backwards, and they're always melting. But when mass melts away at the bottom faster than new mass is added up top, they can recede. It takes about 200 years for new ice to move from the ice field down here to the lake. That's a slow process, but warmer summers combined with less snowfall in winter mean that things are speeding up. The glacier is retreating faster than it's growing. Where I'm standing today was covered in ice just a few decades ago. Glaciers like this are an example of climate change that we can see in our own lifetimes. The physics of how they move is really cool, but for that to keep happening, they have to stay that way. Thanks for watching and stay curious. If you want to see more of Alaska's incredible wildlife, watch Wild Alaska Live, a special three night live event brought to you by PBS and BBC. Check the description for more info. How about down here? How's this? Make, making the YouTubes.
All right, so Mr. Bostrom had mentioned that glaciers are like bulldozers, right? So they pick up everything because really they're giant pieces of ice moving over a continent pulled by gravity down to lower areas, down to the water, down to the ocean. Okay, so they pick up a lot of sediments, anything from boulders to sand, silt, and clay. So the smaller sediments that are carried by a glacier almost act like sandpaper. And we know we've used sandpaper in tech to smooth and polish something. So the bedrock, as it's coming down, the bedrock that that glacier is moving over will become smooth and polished. And the larger sediments, like the boulders and the pebbles, will dig into the bedrock and striate it as it goes over it. You'll get scratches and striations, kind of like this. So again, this rock, it's smaller, but it's a piece of bedrock that a glacier had moved over. It looks like it's been smoothed and polished. You see how like it looks like it's polished, almost like shiny, okay? And then you can see it has some deeper gouges there, and that was caused by a larger particle. So this is in Central Park. You probably, if you've been there, you've seen this. You probably just didn't know what it was. These are all scratches in the bedrock caused by the movement of a glacier. And you could see what which orientation the glacier was moving this way or that way. You know, we, we could figure that out. Think about it's coming from colder areas. So during the last ice age, they were coming from the north, moving to the south. So you could see those scratches are parallel to each other because the glacier was moving in the same direction. Really beautiful. If you've never been there, the glacial evidence there is really outstanding. So there you could see the glacial grooves in some of the rocks right over here, the grooves that got cut into the bedrock and the striations from that material that was stuck in the bottom of the glacier as it went over the bedrock in Manhattan. So the smaller particles like the, the silt, the clay, and the smaller particles like that, you can see this looks like it's polished. It almost looks shiny and smooth, almost like you could slip on it, right? Yet you have like these deep grooves. This almost looks like a U-shaped groove here. That U-shaped groove, obviously something much larger like a cobble or a boulder was being dragged as well. And that's what left that striation in that. And you can see the grooves here are pretty significant right in here. Again, all, all parallel to one another because the glacier is moving in that direction. And then you can, this is again in Central Park. And this boulder, the composition of it, chemically what it's made of is different than the bedrock below it which means it must have been transported or moved here, and it was by a glacier. We're going to talk more about that. They have a special name for it. We're going to talk more, more about it. that later. Okay. So here's just another picture of another glacier. You can see the striations. And the grooves and the rock and the bedrock, and that's telling you the direction that the glacier was moving. Okay, those are striations. This is from uh, Kelly's Island in Ohio. They have the largest glacial grooves in the, in the United States. And look how polished that bedrock looks. You can actually see how smooth it looks. And then those deeper gouges are from the larger sediments that the glacier was carrying. And take a look at the shape of the valley, by the way, that it carved out. What shape is that? It's not a V-shape like a stream. Can you tell me the shape? Um, it is a U-shaped valley. Mm -hmm also evidence that a glacier moved through. So that's giving you the grooves. This was in Grinnell Glacier, which was in Montana, which is in Glacier National Park, which you must go to at some point in time. Um, that's actually my foot, because I'm a big boy. <laughs> I'm a big boy. And you can see, just to give you scale, all right, you can see the scratches in the rock. This was in August. This is called Grinnell Glacier right over here. And that's part of a glacier. It goes all the way back over here and came down this way. And in the summer, it melts. And then this gives you Iceberg Lake. And then take a look at the sediments that were left behind. If you look at these sediments that are left behind, this is not like water. They're not sorted. So when the glacier melted and it left behind sediments, it's all unsorted sediments. And they're just all different shapes. And you can see there's a little warning sign. Caution, do not go onto the glacier alone. Deep crevasses are often hidden by thin snow bridges. So that's why when you see people doing glacier travel, they'll rope into each other so they don't fall in. So kind of like we were just talking about before, sediments that are deposited, once the glacier melts, it leaves behind sediments and those sediments are unsorted. That's what we were showing you in that picture. So this is in your notes, number three. 
3A, sediments left behind by a glacier. They have a special name for it. It's called glacial till. Okay. So this is giving an example of unsorted sediments. You see unsorted sediments in the area. You could say, well, it's probably deposited by a glacier. Good. Nice pronunciation. Unsorted sediments. Again, you have boulders, cobbles, sand, silt, clay, and they're, it's just, it just drops them off. They are unsorted and all different shapes and sizes. So here, this is again, that Grinnell Glacier at Iceberg Lake, you could see all of this material is unsorted, completely unsorted, deposited by a glacier. So in this diagram now, you're, you're, you don't have to know what everything is, but you have to know that we're looking at different formations that were left behind by a glacier. So here's this, this glacier and you have, you know, obviously this end of the glacier here. And we're gonna talk about what that is in a minute. But during times of like ice ages, you have more snowfall than you have melting. So the glacier would advance down gradient, okay? So it had advanced to this point. Once, once it's finished advancing, the furthest point of its advance is called the terminal moraine, okay? Once it begins to melt back, it will drop off all these sediments that we call a moraine, okay? And it will begin to recede or melt. As it melts, now, first of all, this terminal moraine, because it marks the furthest advance of the glacier, these sediments in this hill marking the furthest advance is going to be unsorted sediments because it was deposited by a glacier. As the glacier melts, you notice we have these streams coming off the glacier. So we have these streams of running water. So the sediments in the streams will be sorted, unlike the sediments in the hill left behind by the glacier. So keep that in mind, because you might be asked about how do sediments in the melt water of a glacier compare to the sediments in a terminal moraine or in a moraine. Okay, other things that tell us, you'll, and again, you don't have to know exactly what an esker is. Okay, you do have to know what a drumlin is and a kettle lake, but these are all features that tell us that there was a glacier that moved through the area. If you take a look at this picture, I always think about the bulldozer analogy. So imagine the bulldozer being the glacier and where it stopped, imagine a bulldozer just stopping, you would have just a whole bunch of unsorted stuff in front where just where it stopped. And that's what the terminal moraine is. This glacier then retreated and then moved forward again and then stopped here and then receded again. And that's why the other one's called the recessional moraine. This one's called the terminal moraine, which marks the furthest extent that the glacier advanced. In our case, the United States be the furthest advanced south. So you might have multiple recessional moraines when it, again, seasonal changes or just changes in the climate, but it didn't go past the last terminal moraine. So that's how we know the furthest that the glacier advanced. On Long Island, the Long Island Expressway was built on the terminal moraine of the glacier. That's what gives us this. So the furthest advance during the last ice age of the glacier came down to this Ronkonkoma area here, the Ronkonkoma moraine. That's the terminal moraine for Long Island. And then we have another moraine called the Harbor Hill moraine. Okay. Again, the ice, this was part of, was this the recessional? Yep. Yeah. It was part of the recessional moraine. Okay. And that's all along the North shore. So if you ever go to North shore beaches, you'll notice that they're rocky. Absolutely. There's, there's tons of rocks. I mean, they're not, they're not fun to walk on. Okay, and they're rocky because, well, that's a part of the recessional moraine. It's all unsorted sediments left behind. The meltwater, as the meltwater traveled through Long Island, it began to sort the sediments, which is why we have sandy beaches on the south shore of Long Island. Very exciting stuff. It actually is kind of cool. So a glacial erratic, that's the special name, are large rocks that have been transported by glacial ice without being broken into pieces. That's number four in your notes. And that's where the chemical composition of this rock does not match the chemical composition of the bedrock below it. Sounds similar to transported and transported soils, right? So this is a glacial erratic. These are other pictures of a glacial erratic. Um, there's one that's at the top of bubbles. 
right? Yep, which is a mountain in Acadia National Park in an area called Jordan Pond, and that's called Bubble Rock, and it's a very famous rock because it's precariously perched. It will eventually fall one day, and that's actual Jordan Pond, and the bubble, the bubble rock would be up over here in this area. Beautiful, 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 beautiful area. This is a beautiful lake that was also created by the last glacier that moved through here. And you can see that you have U-shaped valleys. These U-shaped valleys are proof that a glacier moved through here. So how do they move? Well, when you get more snow that accumulates than melts, okay, the bottom layers are under so much pressure they begin to turn to ice, okay? And then the weight, once that ice becomes thick enough, Gravity will pull that ice down gradient towards lower elevations. When the climate warms up, the ice melts, the glacier retreats. So that just gives you an idea of a major ice age, uh, the last ice age, and that imagine all of that snow building up now. Some are valley glaciers because of the mountains, so gravity is helping out. But that pile just keeps building and building and building and then eventually collapses and move out in all directions. And that's the continental ice sheet. And you can see the furthest extent. You can see the arrows are indicating how it moved, right? And you could see right over here. See Long Island, right? Right over there. That's where Long Island was covered by the Wisconsin Glacier. Um, we're going to talk about one really quick little thing that I find interesting. So the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee has some of the greatest biodiversity in the United States. Biodiversity means different species of animals living in the same area. So these species that were chased out of their area by these glaciers were further north. North tends to be cooler. So in Tennessee, the Great Smoky Mountains, the elevation was high enough to have a similar climate to something that was further north. And that's where those animals migrated to and stayed because the climate was compatible with what they're, what they're evolved for because it's at such a high elevation. Beautiful place. You should go check it out. Really awesome. Gives you an idea of the Greenland Glacier. Right, and you look at that glacier, it's advancing. See how dirty it is? That's from all the material that it plucked and pulled and grabbed, and it's all that sediment that it's transporting. Yeah, I'm checking out that sediment, and it looks unsorted. Nice. Yep. Good job. Well played. I know. So this is Glacier National Park. So that's the glacier advancing, and then that's the glacier retreating. Well, <clears throat> quality pictures aren't that great, but they didn't have such great quality pictures back then. And the most important thing, Glaciers carve out U-shaped valleys. So Look at some... that U-shaped valley, or AKA a cirque. That is a cirque. Yeah, right. I know, yeah. I know. So this is Glacier National Park. We took that picture and it's a U-shaped valley. Can't say enough great things about it. You need to go there. Another U-shaped valley. Courtesy of Glacier National Park. Another one, courtesy of Glacier, Glacier National, National Park. Park. Beautiful, there's that one. One of my favorite pictures I've ever taken in my entire life. And there's another U-shaped valley. Again. U-shaped valley is very different. So you know if a river or a glacier has carved out a valley because rivers carve out V-shaped and glaciers carve out U-shaped. And you should know that. Mm. Know the U-shaped valley. You can see the meltwater that glacier creating something. So again, here's another glacier. Here's another U-shaped valley. And a really important factor is that a glacier is fastest in the center of the valley, just like a river, right? Because there's less friction because of the snow particles and the ice particles are rubbing against each other and they're not rubbing against the sides of the valleys or anything like that. And this is an animation. It's a little cheesy, a little outdated, but you can see that there's a V-shaped valley from a river carving it out. And then along comes the glacier and that gives us what kind of shape? A U-shape. A U-shaped valley. Cool. Do you want to say anything else about this animation? No, it's like one of my favorites because like it starts off as a V. Why was it a V? It was a V-shaped valley because a river was traveling through it and down cutting. And then here comes the bulldozer. And now it's a U-shape. So this is an, another animation. Uh, no, sorry, another diagram of it. So you can see the glacier came through here, retreated. And now this glacier melted and we have what's called the Hanging Valley Glacier, which are beautiful. You have something up over here called the escarpment. So the escarpment is very uh, sharp edge, right? And it generally separates from areas of different elevations. So let's say from a plateau to a valley. 
and there is a hiking area in the Catskills called the Escarpment Trail. It's by North Lake, South Lake, and it's right there. That's a picture of the Escarpment Trail and the Catskills. So here's the Escarpment, and it's hard to see because the trees are kind of in the way, but those trees are about 40 feet, um, and that just represents a big drop off, and you can see the Hudson River Valley. It's absolutely beautiful. You should definitely get there. Okay, so let's summarize glaciers because that would just be so much fun. So look at your notes, number six. We're gonna start at letter A. They act, like I said earlier, bulldozers, picking up everything in their paths. They polish and striate the bedrock. Remember, the small sediments will polish it kind of like sandpaper and the larger sediments will striate causing scratches. As more snow falls, the glacier advances. As snow melts, they retreat. When they retreat, they deposit unsorted sediments, okay, such as erratics. Um, that was a larger sediment that's left behind that does not match the bedrock that's below it. Glaciers carve out U-shaped valleys. There you go. That's all summarized. Okay, now we're going to move on to drumlins. And this is exciting. So drumlins are unsorted glacial till deposits. They're elongated hills and they point in the direction that the glacier advances. Now, when we show you a picture, this will become much easier for you. This is what a drumlin, well, this is a picture of a drumlin, kind of. Um, this is what a drumlin looks like. It's a teardrop hill. I just kind of want to show you a real picture. So this is a drumlin right here. See how it looks like a giant teardrop shaped hill? Well, this hill, a glacier created. And it's really cool how it creates this teardrop hill, okay? Notice that we have a steep side of the hill and then elongated, gentle side of the hill, okay? And this teardrop hill points in the direction that the glacier was advancing. We're gonna show you how that works. So what you need to do though, you need to draw this in your notes and you notice that this is a side, the first one is a side view and it's showing you, please put in direction of ice flow because it's pointing in the direction the glacier was advancing to the east because you already have the compass there for the indicating which direction is north. Then this, these are contour lines. Remember that for measuring north? Contour lines showing the changes in elevation. So like Mrs. Bostrom said, we have the steep slope and we have the more gentle slope. This is extremely important. We have to break this video into two parts. So in the second part, you'll see more pictures of all these different glacial features, you'll also see a simulation of how these drumlins actually form, which is quite interesting, but we've reached the maximum capacity of the video right now. Really quick, I'll just tell you that what happens is as the glacier's advancing, it starts to get caught up on something. So sediments begin to build up almost like a wall on the steep side. And then as it moves forward, you'll see this teardrop, you have this gentle side because it kind of, you know, again, stuff is getting stuck on, there might be a giant boulder here that the stuff begins to get stuck on and that's what causes it to build up on the steep side and as it moves forward, okay, you'll have a gentle slope, which is why the teardrop shape points in the direction that the glacier was advancing.